Well, we're uh, beginning a new series of messages tonight, and it's called Why We Serve. And I'd like us to pray before we begin. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us, Lord. And knowing that you are here gives us all the confidence in the world, Lord, that we will leave changed, that we will receive from you tonight. We pray that you have received our offerings of worship and our tithes. I pray that everything that we've done tonight, Lord, will have been pleasing to you. And Lord, now as we speak about why we serve you and serve one another, I pray that we would be more willing than ever to engage in the service that you've called us to and that you would be honored and glorified. I pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4. Speaking on why we serve. Now, I could speak about all kinds of service, how we are to serve others outside the four walls of our congregations. And that's really important. But tonight, I'm actually going to focus really narrowly on a message of why we serve the family of God. And the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let's do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So I'm narrowing my focus tonight down to why we serve one another in the body of believers and why we serve in Jerusalem to be particular. For it's interesting that Paul said this, having requested of the Romans to pray for him, he said, pray that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And we want our service to Jerusalem to be acceptable to all the saints, to the household of faith. But let's read our main text now, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus the Messiah. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. My goal tonight is to motivate each and every one of us to use the gifts that God has given to us to serve one another in the body of believers, especially here in Jerusalem. From our text, 1 Peter chapter 4, we find the answers to the question, why we serve. There's actually six answers to the question. We're going to deal with two of them tonight and hopefully four more next week. So let's look at the first two reasons why we serve one another in the household of faith. The first reason we serve is in order that God may be glorified. This is what our text says, in order that in everything God may be glorified. That's verse 10. Now, Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, that they may see your good works, that they may glorify or to give glory or honor to your Father who is in heaven. We serve, we do good works, that God may receive all the honor and glory. How does God get glory or honor when we serve one another? Well, when we serve one another, a light goes on. Our light shines before those who observe what we're doing. And when we serve one another, onlookers think to themselves, normal people serve themselves. But here I see some, a group of people serving one another. What's going on with these people? And when they look closer, they discover it's because of our devotion to our Father who is in heaven and that we are doing it for his glory. And that 
gives him front and center on the stage. He's the one who is lit up. The spotlight turns to him rather than to ourselves. Earlier, I didn't read the entire context of the verse that I read. Let me read it more. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says that one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Yeshua the Messiah, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. In everything, God may be glorified through Yeshua the Messiah. God gets glory from his son, Yeshua. It's Yeshua who best gives honor and glory to the Father. Yeshua prayed to the Father in John chapter 17, verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Yeshua tells us that a major part of his, what a major part of his work was. He says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yeshua said to his disciple Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So when we see Yeshua serving, we know that the Father also must have a servant heart for his people, for his children. Yeshua reflects the character of God. Did you know that God is a servant God? Hard to believe, but it's true. Yeshua, because he came in human flesh, was able to show us the Father in the most tangible, touchable, visible way possible. In fact, in John chapter 13, the chapter before this, we have a beautiful picture of God's heart to serve others, those he loves. It's the Last Supper, and you remember how Yeshua stooped down so low, and he took the towel that was meant to be on the servant who was supposed to be at the door, to wash the dirty and smelly feet of the visitors, and yet that servant wasn't there, and none of the disciples went and took initiative and became a servant. But Yeshua himself demonstrated true servanthood by wrapping the towel around himself and stooping down and washing their feet. That's pretty tangible. You want to see the Father, just look at Yeshua doing practical things. It will reflect upon God and who he is. And then in verse 14 and 15, we read this in the same context. If then your Lord and teacher, and this is Yeshua speaking, if then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. So when we obey Yeshua and follow his example by serving one another, we accomplish one of the main reasons we serve. We shine a light on the servant heart of the Father, and he gets all the glory for it. As Peter says in our text, one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything, even in practical, menial tasks, in everything, God may be glorified through Yeshua the Messiah to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In the same John 3, uh, 13 passage, at that last supper where Yeshua washes his disciples' feet, Yeshua tells us why he does what he does. Verse 31, Yeshua says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now Yeshua is probably referring primarily to his upcoming suffering, death, then resurrection and ascension. God will get glory through all of those things. But it was in the context of him washing his disciples' feet that he says this. And in fact, anything that the Son does in obedience to the Father's will is acting out the servant heart of God, and ultimately, God gets glory through his service. So we see that whenever we love one another, if we follow Yeshua's example... It turns the light on for people. They realize that we are his disciples. In fact, in the same context, before they leave that upper room where they had the Last Supper, Yeshua says this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
So in our service, because we love one another, people will know that we are his disciples. We don't do these things just because we're going to get glory, because that's just the thing we're supposed to do. It's expected of us. It's the It's the civil thing to do. No, we do it ultimately that people will know that we're his disciples. We do it because we want to get the Father to receive all of the glory and the honor for what we do. Now, isn't that really the most important reason why we serve? It's not because we have desperate needs. Yes, we do have desperate needs, but it's 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 a much bigger thing here. We serve to give God glory. Now, how will that affect the way we serve? If it's all about him, it's all about his glory, then how will that affect the way we serve one another? Well, first of all, we will serve faithfully, faithfully. Peter writes, following our text in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. He's saying God is faithful. If God is faithful, then when you do what you're doing, the good things that you're doing, make sure you're faithful as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, this is how one should regard us as servants of the Messiah and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they may be found faithful. So when you agree to do a task, I'm going to help you. I'm going to come and clean your house. Somebody's sick. Somebody's not able to clean their house. You say, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come at such and such an hour and such and such a day, and you come three or four hours late, or you, you don't come at all, and you don't call, and don't say why you didn't come, but your attitude is, well, I'll get around to it, and I'm doing them a favor anyway. That is not working with an attitude of faithfulness that will ultimately bring glory to God. That'll send the wrong message about who who God is. When his servants act unfaithfully, then how can we be sure God is going to be faithful to us? Our Heavenly Father would never do that to us. He's a faithful God. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 and following, Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to good give give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And so when we serve one another, we don't take shortcuts and we don't substitute one task for another and say, well, I'll help you this way. I know I told you I'd help you the other way. No, if somebody's asking for a fish, you don't give them a serpent. If you're going to be faithful as God is faithful to his children, you're going to come through with what that person asked of you and you agreed to do. One day, we're going to be held accountable for how faithful we have been as God's stewards or his servants. In fact, Yeshua told us the parable of the servants and the talents and the commendation of the master related first and foremost to how faithfully they stewarded his resources. To the ones he was pleased with, what did he say? Well done, good and faithful servant. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Let a man so consider us as servants of the Messiah and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Paul's highest commendation he gives to fellow colleagues in the work of the Lord is how they were faithful as servants of God. Listen to this. He writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, concerning Epaphras. He says, Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of the Messiah on your behalf. Paul writes later in Colossians 4, 7, concerning Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. And so I encourage each and every one of us who wants to bring glory to God in our service that we will serve faithfully in all that we do. Number two, another attitude that we ought to have if we want to bring glory to God in our service, and that is that we will serve humbly. We will serve humbly. If we serve others with pride, 
thinking that, well, I'm doing you a favor and I'm stooping down to your level to help you, and we see ourselves as up here some, somehow, we're not going to bring glory to God. Pride will not bring glory to God. It will focus attention on you rather than the Father. If we serve others with pride and do it in order to bring attention to ourselves, God gets zero out of our service. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 to 7, What is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants whom you have believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Now listen to this, verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. One great theologian said, God created the world out of nothing, and so as long as we are nothing, he can make something out of us. That's good. You know, often I've heard pastors and apostolic leaders who seem to have the the opposite attitude that Paul is encouraging us with. They call their congregation, my church. In conversations, in hallways, at conferences, and I've been to many. I've heard comments like, he's running 500 people in his Sunday morning services. He's running? He's doing anything? It's God who's doing it. And God uses us us as his servants. And what a privilege that is. It's awesome. It's not about he. It's not about me. It's about him up there. Well, one known, a well-known observer of ministries said this, no one can tell how many churches have disintegrated into power struggles, splitting congregations. The spokesmen for the warring camps usually cloak their actions in such idealistic claims as standing for truth or being faithful to the gospel. But we are all too aware that behind such conflicts are people vying for power. That's often the case. Speaking of power rather than humility in our service, a child in first grade was told by his mom to come directly home from school, but he arrived late almost every day. The difference in time amounted to as much as 20 minutes, and his mother asked him one day, you get out of school the same time every day. Why can't you get home at the same time? He said, it depends on the cars. What do cars have to do with it? The youngster explained, well, the patrol boy who takes us across the street makes us wait until some cars come along so he can stop them. (laughs) Some of you have seen such people. I mean, that's why I'm late. Richard Foster, who's one of the best-known authors on spiritual disciplines, says, The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. It will devise subtle, religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service rendered. If we stoutly refuse to give in to this lust of the flesh, we crucify it. Every time we crucify the flesh, we crucify our pride and arrogance. So tonight we're talking about why we serve. We serve in order to bring glory to God. And when we understand that that's why we serve, it will change our attitude in in our service. We will do it faithfully because we're in the image of God, the faithful one. We want to reflect his character so that people will look at him. And we do it humbly. We get out of the way and let God be seen, don't we? It's not about us getting glory, it's about him getting all of the attention and all of the glory. So I come to the second and last reason we serve in this message tonight. We've seen that we serve to give glory to God. Secondly, we serve because this is our occupation. This is our occupation. Peter puts it this way in our text. In 1 Peter 4, verse 10, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Do it to serve one another as as good stewards. The Greek word here refers to a manager 
or of a household or of household affairs. Uh, the Greek word uh, usually refers to either a freedman or a slave. There were many slaves that were given responsibility over his owner's affairs, over his owner's home and possessions. Slaves in Peter's day didn't own anything, but they were owned by their master. They served not only their own they served not their own interests, but they served exclusively the interests of their master. This was their occupation. The point Peter is making here is that our occupation is to manage God's resources and to serve God's interests. And when Peter says that we are to serve one another as good stewards, we understand that whenever we help others, we are helping the people of God. These are God's people. These are God's resources. When you serve other people, you are serving God. You understand? You are being a manager of his resources. You're watching out for his interests. And I can tell you, God is interested in each and every one of us. And to the degree we serve those people he's interested in, to the same degree he considers us faithful servants. Did you know that being a servant is a high calling? We get a sense of this in a number of verses in the Hebrew Scriptures. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 55 says, For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. Isaiah 49, verse 3, and he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Even the greatest of God's pioneers and heroes of the faith understood that their primary occupation was not to be a prophet or to be a king or to be a priest. Their primary occupation was to be a servant of God. In fact, the prophets are called my servants. There were kings that were called the servants of the Lord. Servanthood is the premier, the primary occupation of each and every one of us. When God was angry with the children of Israel for making a golden calf, and he seemed to be ready to destroy them, Moses stood in the gap and he interceded on behalf of Israel. He appealed to God on the basis of their three great forefathers, he cries out in Exodus chapter 32, verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself. Your servants. The forefathers of the tribes of Israel were also servants of the Lord. They declared to their brother Joseph before they recognized him to be their brother. In Genesis chapter 42, verse 13, Your servants are 12 brothers, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. They understood that they weren't just servants of God here. They are even servants of this man, Joseph, whom they did not recognize. Later, we read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 17 and 18, Jacob instructing his sons that when they go and see Joseph this next time, that they should do this. Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they, didn't, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of, the God, of God your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants." In Exodus 4, verse 10, we read, then, then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. Dozens of times in the Hebrew Scriptures, and I've looked at every one of this as I've prepared this message, dozens of times Moses is referred to by God as my servant, Moses. And in fact, we read about Moses in Numbers 12, 3. Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Moses understood that he wasn't the prince of Egypt. That wasn't his occupation and his calling. He was a servant of the Most High God. 
And then there's Joshua. He was not only the servant of the Lord, but he was literally a servant of Moses. In fact, we read in Exodus 33, verse 11, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. But his servant Joshua did not depart from the tabernacle. Later in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 8, God refers to King David as my servant David who kept my commandments and who followed me with all of his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. Then there's Nehemiah who was so concerned with his Jewish brother, brethren in Judea and so concerned about the city of Jerusalem and how its horrible condition reflected upon the God of Jerusalem, the God of the, the people of Israel. And so he appeals <clears throat> and he prays. Listen to his prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 9 and following. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and we have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses is saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. <laughs> you see all the times he refers to him being a servant, the people of God being servants, and ends the prayer saying, for I was the king's cupbearer. He could have exalted himself beyond that. He could have said, and I am the one that God called to save Jerusalem and to rebuild its walls. I was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. Is that your attitude? Is that my attitude? Is that how I see my occupation? First and foremost, a servant to God and a servant to others. I could go on and on through the Hebrew Scriptures. We could go into the New Testament. How many times we read about Paul and other apostles saying, referring to themselves as a servant of the Lord. Now, here today in Jerusalem, one of the common questions you are asked when you meet somebody for the first time is, what do you do? And what do they want to know? Not what are you doing, you know, when you get up in the morning, what kind of food you eat. They want to know what your occupation is. And within a split second, they're already evaluating where you rank. And it's not just in Jerusalem, by the way. This is universal. It's in every city and in every town and in every countryside. This is the way we're wired. We think about what we do and who we are and, and what our position is. Daniel also knew his chief, chief occupation in life. He said, listen to his prayer to God. Now, therefore, hear the prayer of your servant and supplications for the Lord's sake. Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. But when somebody asks you what your occupation is, maybe one time you should at least try it and say, I'm a servant. And they'll say, well, really? Where do you serve? You know, years ago, they used to use the term civil servant much more often than they do today. And when you speak of a civil servant as someone who's working for the nation, for the government, as somebody who serves the interest of the city or the nation. And I've been to Singapore a number of times, and that's a, where they still use that term very often. A number of uh, leaders uh, of congregations uh, told me that 60% of Singapore today um, work as civil servants in the government of Singapore. And we know that Singapore is one of the most prosperous nations on earth. In spite of its smallness, uh, it's it is very prosperous and very organized. 
very orderly, as you know, and I'm not uh, advocating everything that the government does in Singapore, but I am saying this, that whenever you have a nation where people see themselves as serving the interests beyond themselves, you will find a prosperous nation. One of the reasons why many nations that have been prosperous in the past, they were, they were built upon a foundation of servanthood. People understood that it wasn't just about them, but it was about the greater good of the brotherhood, of the household of faith, and, in, and even beyond that to, to their nations and beyond that to the world. Many nations today are disintegrating. Once great nations are falling apart because of self-interest rather than the interests of the greater good. I like what one commentator said, Christ's ideal of greatness is like an inverted pyramid. The nearer to the peak, the greater the burden, and the more people are carried in love. On the cross, he reached the point of love's inverted pyramid and there bore the sins of the world. Now, if we were more like the Messiah, then we wouldn't be those at the top of the pyramid that think the pyramid is shaped like this. We would see it was just the opposite. It's upside down. And the fact, if we're at the top of the pyramid in some kind of organization or, or business or ministry, we ought to understand that we're really at the bottom and we're, we're simply serving more people. The higher the responsibility the more and more privilege, the more people are going to be on our team, but it also means the more people you're going to be carrying and serving. Yeshua said, or Paul said, that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of the Messiah. That's servanthood. You bear the burdens of others. You're at the peak of the pyramid, but it's all upside down. You're lifting others up. So I've reminded us tonight of two reasons why we serve. We serve in order to bring glory to God. And secondly, we serve because it is our God-given occupation. We're going to cover four more of these reasons, probably all in next week's message. We'll just see how well we, we do with that. But I want to share this with you tonight. In conclusion, I want to encourage you with what we find in Numbers chapter 4, verse 30 to 32. And this is what the Lord says through Moses concerning everyone who enters the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. That's verse 30. And this is what they must carry as all their service for the tabernacle of meeting, the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, and the pillars around the court with their sockets, pegs, and cords, with all of their furnishings and all their service. And you shall assign to each man by name the items he must carry. We learn something important here, don't we? That ministry, divine service, is not just about teaching the word or playing or singing on a worship team or some other visible and outward, seemingly spiritual activity. Rather, the ones who were chosen for ministry, full-time ministry, the Levites, were called to all kinds of service that would appear to be mundane and unimportant. And yet all of it was holy service. It was divine service in the tabernacle of the Lord. And God elevated that. God made it holy. God made it special. In fact, everything that we do in service, if it is unto Him becomes a high calling in the kingdom of God. Paul talks about gifts in the body, and he says those, those parts of the body that are unseemly, the ones who are maybe hidden and, and don't seem to have any real value, he said, actually, we should be encouraging those gifts in particular. So God's way of looking at things is totally different than ours. Remember Yeshua the greatest servant of all, spent most of his lifetime on earth serving in a workshop. Think about that. J.C. Ryle said, he was a great bishop 
in England. He said, the church of Christ needs servants of all kinds and instruments of every sort, pen knives as well as swords, axes as well as hammers, chisels as well as saws, Mar Martha's as well as Mary's, Peter's as well as John's. In Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, Paul speaks about the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they're called by God to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That word ministry in the original Greek is the word diokonia. Diokonia can mean all kinds of service rendered to others. It's interesting to read in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, where they dealt with the issue of the Hellenistic Jewish widows who weren't receiving fairly what they should have been given, like the other Jewish um, widows were given. And the apostles appointed deacons. It comes from the same word. Which actually is used to refer to both serving tables, like a waiter, and the ministry of the word. The serving of tables and the ministry of the word, in God's, God's eyes, are of the same sort. It's ministry. It's service unto God. In building the tabernacle and the temple, there was a need for designers and craftsmen like Bezalel. And once built, they needed people who would clean and maintain these places of worship. And they needed gatekeepers, maybe in our minds today, ushers. They needed people who would be willing to stand by night in the house of the Lord. And they needed all kinds of people to carry on every aspect of the service of God in his presence and in his tabernacle. And so tonight, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge each and every one of us to think and pray about how we can serve. Maybe in beyond what we're already doing in service for him, or if you're not involved in service at all, that you would take on the challenge to take on a task, take on a ministry, and ultimately bring glory to God, which is our main reason for all that we do. And I'm talking about practical things here. Not all of us can preach Sunday nights from this pulpit. Not all of us can do various tasks, but there's some task out there that you're able to do. It might be for a season. It might be for a long time. It might be part of your training to move from one area of ministry into another, whatever it might be. But all of us are called into God's service. We're going to be having tables. In fact, they're already ready out just beyond the lobby outside in the, in the, uh, the mall. And we're going to have various representatives from our team there that uh, will be there to meet you. You may know some of them already. Each of those tables will have a different sign designating a different kind of ministry that we're engaged in here in Jerusalem. And we'd like you to come and just talk with us. And uh, if you're interested, give us your name and your, your phone number and your email. That's all we need so that we can follow up with you and find the best area of ministry that you're wired for or the ministry that has such an urgent need that even if you're not primarily wired in that direction... For now, you can give us your help. And ultimately, you'll find your place doing the things that you are most gifted for. And I'm also talking about the body beyond King of Kings. Our understanding of the body is that all believers in Jerusalem are one body and one household of faith. That's just the way we're wired. That's the way we see things around here. And I've had pastors from time to time come to me and say, Wayne, do you know of so, uh, somebody that could help us in this area of ministry? I got a call last week, and I was able to tell that, that pastor about someone in our congregation who's got that kind of gifting and refer her to him. There was a pastor recently who said, I'm desperately in need of a worship leader. Wayne, in your congregation, you've got all kinds of worship leaders. We don't have even one. And I want to be able to answer that request. There are all kinds of things that we can do to bring glory to God in what we do. How many of you want to see the glory of God manifested in Jerusalem? Amen? Well, we want to see the fire fall 
That's great. We want to see miracles, signs, and wonders. But God also gets great attention and glory and honor through service one to another. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us be a congregation, not of spectators, but participants. That every member will be a minister and every saint a servant. Every member a minister and every saint a servant. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts, show us where we fit, where we can contribute, where we can make a difference. That your name might be praised. Amen. We're going to be doing this for two weeks. So you don't have to make a commitment tonight. You can already talk to us, and, and then you've got time to pray. You'll come back to us next week and hopefully be able to sign on the dotted line and say, yeah, I can do this for this season, for this number of months, and, uh, and we'll joyfully put you into the ministry of the Lord. God bless you. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord and praise his name.